Science, and it's a great pleasure uh, to welcome uh, you all having embraced the weather, which gets, keeps being horrid and very humid days as well this winter. So thank you all for coming, and it's a great pleasure to welcome today um, Professor Chris Daphne. Um, uh, it's a pleasure to welcome him to the Wexner Center for the Arts and to Ohio State University. Uh, the first thing I want to do is thank uh, the Wexner Center for um, hosting the event and also the Center for, uh, of Latin American Studies at OSU for um, co-sponsoring. Um, Chris is an academic geographer, investigative journalist, and author, living and working in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. He has conducted research in Brazil since 2004, when he began work on his book, Temples of the Earthbound Gods, which uses football stadiums in Buenos Aires and Rio as lenses to observe the shifting urban landscape from the 19th to the early 21st century. In 2009, he returned to Rio de Janeiro on a Fulbright Fellowship, where he began an investigation of the urban, political, and economic interventions for the 2014 World Cup. He is currently a visiting professor at the Universidade Federal Fluminense in Niterói, and in 2015, he will take a position as a senior researcher at the University of Zurich. In the context of the interdisciplinary project of Via Brasil, today he will speak of the shifting processes of urban governance through which Brazil has come to host this cycle of major events and the networks of resistance taking shape as World Cup preparations accelerate. Thank you, Ines. Functioning? 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 Sorry. Hello? Not working? Oh, yeah. Now working? Yeah. Wait, oh, now it's working. Mm -hmm. Now, hello. Turning on. Hello. I'm creating tension here. This is, okay, there we go. Thanks. All right. Well, thank you very much, Ines, and I'd like to thank you to Ohio State University and the Wexler Center for bringing me up to this horrible weather. I was really enjoying Rio's weather for a while, but this is now. I'm coming to Ohio for your sunshine. Nossa Senhora. Um, but today I will be talking about uh, my trajectory, both as an academic, um, as a football fan, um, as a researcher, and as an activist in Rio de Janeiro, and um, looking at uh, using my own personal trajectory through these mega events to kind of explain what's going on, and really highlighting the social aspect of the protests that are going to that were going on last year and that are still ongoing that will happen again uh, this coming summer and then looking uh, finally at what the protests are a reaction to um, and so this is that's basically the traje trajectory of the talk today um, just as a brief reminder that this is all of course historically and geographically contextualized the border the shifting borders of brazil um, are no longer much of an issue but we're, we're spreading this the world cup tournament around 12 cities that each have their particular histor historical context and while it will be focusing explicitly on rio de janeiro you should keep in mind that these other there's similar processes happening in 12 cities in brazil uh, right now as we prepare for the world cup uh, rio de janeiro we frequently uh, just associate rio with the the Paggio Sucre, the Zona Sul, the, gro the global image of Rio is a very limited one. But it's good to remember that Rio de Janeiro is a metropolitan area of up to 13 and a half million people, where it depends on where you start or stop measuring. It's a massive area, uh, many, many times uh, the size of the Manhattan metropolitan area. And so there's some dense parts, there's some non-dense parts. And the problematic conditions that we face with a metropolitan area of this size is that there's no metropolitan planning agency whatsoever. So there's no linkages between the various uh, municipalities that connect the city. There is less than 30% sewage coverage in the city, and so the problems of um, urbanization of, uh, of this kind in a, in a water-rich uh, environment are really problematic. These transportation uh, problems that have uh, been exacerbated by this lack of integrated uh, planning have created a city which has the longest commutes in Brazil. Most people commute more than an hour and a half each way to work. And we, of course, in order to keep people quiet, we have developed over time the most violent police force in the world in terms of killing of civilian populations, and that's for the Rio de Janeiro State, uh, typically from the Rio de Janeiro State Military Police. 
And so those are kind of the background conditions that uh, would, maybe would set a little bit of the stage for what I'll be talking about here. And um, as Inez mentioned, I had begun my research in Brazil actually in 2003, and from between 2004 and 2006 produced this book called Temples of the Earthbound Gods, which took four stadiums in the geographic core of Rio de Janeiro and analyzed the transformations in the urban landscape using these stadiums as lenses to, uh, to look at social, economic, and political, and political change. Um, I left Rio de Janeiro in 2004, uh, in 2000, I went back in 2006, but right on the, on the eve of the Pan American Games. So Rio had initially bid for the, the Olympics in 2004, they also bid for the 2012 Olympics and failed at both times. But since then has entered into an almost unprecedented string of mega events that are being hosted in the city, starting with the 2007 Pan American Games, the 2011 World Military Games, the Hugh Mais uh, Economic or Environmental Conference, the 2013 Confederations Cup, followed by the Pope's visit, followed by the World Cup, followed by the, by the Olympics. And so we've got a decade of mega events in Rio de Janeiro that I'm gonna try to work a little bit through, but it's good to remember that at each one of these events, we come to a, a critical stage where we have an, a concentration of security, we have a concentration of visitors, we really stress out our urban systems with each progressive mega event. And in each one of these, we've seen uh, a lot of sy these systems break. We've seen the police uh, forces be multiplied and act with extreme violence and a lot of uh, human rights violations. As part of this process, in 2005, they formed the Comité Social du Pain with the Social Committee of the Pan American Games. And this is a group of academics, of uh, social activists, of uh, syndicatos, of social movements, and of residents that came together to resist uh, forced removals, to protest against the escalating costs of the event, um, which ended up being 10 times over the initial budget, and to uh, protest against the militarization of the city, in which 750 million reais of public money were spent uh, for the preparation of the Pan American Games. On the eve of the Pan American Games, you can see this uh, the transformation of the the motto into, into crosses. On the eve of the Pan American Games, the Balpi, Rio's elite military police, entered into the Complexo de Alemão and killed 19 people um, to pacify once and for all the Complexo de Alemão. Of course, they were then uh, instrumental in invading the favela complex again in 2010. Um, and so this was the first major movement in Brazil, the Comité Social do Pan, was the first major movement in Brazil to organize against the realization of mega events. And this is back in 2005. And so the, tra the trajectory of social resistance to these events that we saw last summer, uh, very clearly expressed, has its roots in these movements uh, from the Pan American Games. When I moved back to Brazil in 2009, I became uh, very involved with football fans' movements trying to uh, challenge the status quo of the political economy of Brazilian football and help to form this association called the Associação Nacional dos Torcedores, which had a very short life, uh, and I wrote about it here in this, uh, the Journal of Sport and Social Issues last year. Um, about, and it was a very enriching experience about how to mobilize socially in the face of almost overwhelming economic and political forces. Um, we were basically looking to end the influence of the global television network in football to have more transparency in the Brazilian Football Confederation. And we're successful in helping to raise a, a public awareness that ended up with the, the resigning uh, with Ricardo Teixeira, who was the then uh, president of the foot, Brazilian Football Federation, resigned as a result of a lot of the protests that the ANT was able to bring to public, public consciousness. The, um, but as you can see, there's, there's something, this is our symbol, and there's something wrong, there was something a little bit wrong about the way we went about this, because if you have one ant, you can't really do a lot. And so this really should have been a million ants holding a million different flags that could come together. But with this, this, our strategies, even from the beginning, from the way we designed what was going to happen with the INT were limited, and I talk about this in the article, um, that these challenges that exist in 
in broad-based social movements that depend on electronic media for, to bring people together are also very fragile, and you really need to have a better structure. Um, but these, these lessons uh, gave way to, uh, or they, they built on and with what has now become the leading movement against mega events in Brazil, called the Comité, Social, uh, Comité Popular da Copa das Olimpíadas in Rio de Janeiro. And this group came out of the, the Comité Social do Pan, the ANT people like myself that were uh, involved in both the Comité uh, Social do Pan and the ANT came back into the Comité Popular and have since really helped to articulate a lot of the discourses that the Comité uses against the realization of mega events because this is a very powerful discursive framework that comes with the Olympics, that comes with the World Cup, the, the ideas of legacy, the ideas of social benefit, the ideas of investing public money for potential future benefit are very strong and need to be disarticulated um, in, in, in public discourse. And the Comité Popular has two basic things that they're looking to do. They're looking to end forced removals in the city for transportation projects, for mega event related projects, forced removals primarily of lower income communities of favelas and for the non-privatization of public facilities in public space, in particular, the Maracanã. And this is currently the most active group in Brazil. It's comprised, again, of people from the academy, uh, people from sindicatos, uh, social movements, and from NGOs. And so we have places like uh, Global Justice, Witness, uh, StreetNet, these uh, NGOs that have a global presence, but that are articulating in Rio de Janeiro. And the Comité Social do Pan, uh, do, the Comité Popular uh, da Copa, is actually what we call a space of articulation. It doesn't actually have a legal identity, but it's more of a place where all these different interests can come together and articulate a common message. And we've tried to very, be very direct and very simple about what we want to do, and that's to limit, uh, to eliminate forced removals and to return um, return public works to public hands. One of the ways in which we do this is through a combination with, as I mentioned, with the academy. And this is the important uh, role that, uh, that I think I've played and others have played is that we had a, a very large scale research project at the Universidade Federal, Fumine, uh, Universidade Federal do Rio de Janeiro in the planning department there, where we had nine research groups researching 12 World Cup cities for three years along these five lines of research. And each one of these lines of research was then connected with the Comité Popular of all those cities. And so there are 12 World Cup host cities, there are 12 Comités Populares. And each one of those Comités Populares had a connection with the research that we were doing at UFRJ. And so the, the, the academics were feeding into the social movements that were then collaborating to produce documents that characterized Human rights violations. And sorry, this is a little bit fuzzy. It's called Mega Eventos Violações dos Direitos Humanos no Rio de Janeiro. Mega events and uh, mega events and human rights violations in Rio de Janeiro. And this is one of the products of the Comité uh, Popular. This goes out to journalists. This goes out to the UN. This goes out to the International Olympic Committee. This goes to FIFA. It goes to citizens to raise awareness about what's going on as we prepare for these big events. Then. At the national level, we have what's called the uh, Articulação Nacional dos Comités Populares, ANCOPI, the National Articulation of Popular Committees that brings together all 12 popular committees to elaborate national strategies for resistance. And one of the results of this is a national dossier of human rights violations. That, again, goes to the UN. It goes to the Olympic Committee, it goes to FIFA, it goes to journalists, it goes uh, as, far, as far and wide as we, can, as we can spread it, and it's available on the websites for download. The National Committee on Copy, as you can see here at the bottom, is very keen to use social media to get their message across. Brazil is the number two uh, user of Twitter in the world after the United States in terms of numbers of Twitter users, with one-third of the population. And so the hashtags of no vai ter direitos, no vai ter culpa, no vai ter not going to have one thing or another, 
every week or every two weeks there's a new campaign to keep these messages alive in the public consciousness so that when the World Cup comes back around, people will be plugged in to what the local committees have been doing. And this is what it looks like. So in addition to being involved in what's happening uh, you know, in, the, in the social media and articulating the academic message with social movements, the strategy is to go out on the streets and bring this message to the places where that are being privatized. And so this is a, an anti-privatization movement uh, at the Maracana right before a game. And so there's Maraca para quem? Uh, who is the Maracana for? No to privatization and hemosoys. And these typically attract between 500 and sometimes 5,000 people. Then again, here another strategy is to block traffic uh, with the banners. The Maraca and also uh, group brought together a lot of different uh, social actors that were, involved, that were being negatively impacted with the privatization of the Maracana and would get together and, as you can see, standing on an overpass with some police nearby, but blocking traffic during rush hour, handing out pamphlets, playing music, having a party, trying to close, close the streets as they march towards the governor's palace. Sometimes these end in violence where the police just come up and start whacking people and everybody has to run away. Um, other times they end like this one, ended peaceably. You can also see in the background the PC, PCB, uh, Communist Party of Brazil. This other flag is a PSTU flag. Um, and so there has been a lot of competition, or, or not a lot of competition, but a lot of conflict about whether or not these can turn into political movements as well, rather than just to be social movements. And so during the big parade in June of 2013, when there were 600,000 people on the streets of Rio, there were actually fights between social movement actors and political parties to take the political party, party flags out of the parade um, because people didn't want it to be kind of the same old, uh, same old political fighting about these events. Also, uh, subversive activities. This was the opening game of the Maracana, bringing the no uh, removals banner that we saw in the first, first picture into the stadium space itself, and then opening it up right in front of all the media. And so, you know, there's a, the element of a festival here uh, that was brought in, but then, of course, the international media is the main, one of the main audiences for these kind of, for these kind of acts. And these acts are coordinated within the space of the Comité. Again, political actors, this flag, nada deve perecer impossível de mudar, was one of the, um, was the campaign slogan of Marcelo Freixo for the city uh, mayor, for the mayor, of course, mayor to see. But he, um, he has bans and a lot of uh, social movements that support his candidacy and he funds some of these, uh, some of these uh, parades through his uh, political office. So that's what it looks like when it's peaceable. This is what it looks like when it's kind of the, the black October of Munich, 1972. This on the bottom right is an indigenous uh, activist. This was the Museo do Inju at the site of the Maracanã that was threatened with demolition and was uh, the, the people that had been settled there or had occupied this space for the previous six years were forcibly removed by shock troops. And so it has this, at one, at one side, it has this ludic element, this carnivalesque, this social movement, this positive uh, energy about the, the resistance. It then also has this very hard edge to it um, with very violent resistance at times and equally violent reactions on the part of the police, which I'll show you now. This is the, the, Cobra, Cobra, the final of the Confederations Cup in 2013. A massa resistiu bravamente com pedras, bojões, morteiros e coquetéis molotov.
think you probably get the idea. Um, I was there that day, and it was it's, and many other days during the Confederations Cup. This was a typical scene where you have a lot of protesters. Um, some will, they're, they're called black blocks, will come in and start some aggression against the police. Sometimes the police are infiltrated amongst the protesters to, um, to start violence that will justify the police reaction. And you can see that those guns they're firing are not live bullets, um, but rubber bullets. And so they're firing rubber bullets into a retreating civilian population, uh, launching these uh, launch tear gas um, that they, they've launched so much tear gas during the Confederations Cup, they ran out and started buying tear gas that was twice, twice the legal strength. They also started buying bombs of the uh, percussion grenades that were twice the legal strength that the company that manufactures them would only export to Angola before. And so there's, um, there's really in, been an increase in the police violence uh, against protesting in Brazil. And we saw this very clearly last year and it will probably be doubled down again for the World Cup uh, in just a few months. And so this is one of the major concerns of the social movements is how do we interact with these situations. Um, on this day at the Confederations Cup final, there was a, a relatively peaceful protest organized by the Comité Popular in the morning, and then a protest in the afternoon that was looking for direct confrontation with the police, and that's what they got. Um, of course, famously, during the Confederations Cup final, there was so much tear gas in and around the Maracanã that it floated into the stadium, and the, the players on the field could uh, feel the tear gas in their throat as they were playing. And so this is, you can expect that this sort of thing will happen again during the World Cup, uh, especially in Rio de Janeiro, um, in, in just a couple months. Right, and so looking at the, and remembering the, the larger urban context of the, the metropolitan area, this is the map for the Olympics. And so it's a very limited vision of what the city is. Uh, four zones that are being primed for development and relatively limited urban interventions. Here we can see these orange lines are existing roads. And the one, there's one dotted line that was a new BRT system and, and a metro line that would have come down to the Bajo de Tijuca region. We'll see in a second that these projects have been altered and expanded uh, to create a new kind of uh, dynamic in the city. So this is now the new kinds of investment that's going to happen for the Olympics. Um, these are all the new transportation lines that are being put in, again with the Olympic clusters. And we can see that this, the Baja de Tijuca region here, is receiving the majority of the investment. And it's a, the map's a little bit deceiving uh, in that the center already concentrates a lot of existing development. Um, and so this is the new project that's being put forth by the Olympic uh, by the Olympic Games Committee. And this tells you a little bit more about what's actually happening with the new lines. And so these are the new lines, uh, the bus lines that are going through this really dense urban fabric. And in Rio de Janeiro alone, we estimate there will be more than 30,000 forced or partial removals to put these three transportation lines in. Or actually, there are four, really trans Brasil. Uh, this is, again, what, one of the things the Comité Popular is focusing on. I've been doing research on these lines for the last three years. And this is what it looks like when you have a forced removal. This is the Villa Armonia, uh, which was forcibly removed in April of 2011. Um, this guy's house, this guy's Georgie, resisted removal as, much as, pos as long as possible. The entire community was destroyed around him. He refused to leave. But you can see the tenuous connections, the ele tenuous electricity connection, his tenuous connection to the city, to formality. You can also see the future uh, transportation line coming this way. And you can see also the march of the closed condominiums that this transportation line is making way for. And so this entire region of the city had previously been, been, been rezoned. The transportation lines were then approved by decree and then forced removal started happening with the justification that this land needed to be used for the transportation, transportation line itself. There is currently nothing on this site. It's just grass. And so there was no need for the removal. There are uh, condominiums just, if it's, you could see 360, it would be condominiums right over here. So it's what we consider a process of just cleaning the landscape uh, for the benefit of closed condominium dwellers. In another part of the city, uh, this is another, the site of another BRT line. 
where houses are being demolished and just the rubble left. And so what we have in a lot of these communities where the houses have been uh, destroyed and left are crackheads coming in and finding the most valuable materials and or people just throwing them their trash on top of it because it already looks like a rubbish heap. And so you're really destroying community uh, dynamics, you're destroying more uh, living conditions for transportation lines. And this is um, the favela do Metro, which is close to the Maracanã, which was being leveled to make a parking lot for vans that will drop people off at the Maracanã during the World Cup. And of course, this is a human, it's a health hazard. This girl, little girl is getting water out of this broken pipe so she can drink. Um, there were rats, there were, you know, uh, just, uh, just a really terrible, really sad situation of what used to be a relatively close-knit community. And this is happening all over Rio de Janeiro. And so we can look at this uh, as, as, a, as a political project more than a transportation project. And so what we're seeing, we're calling it a polistinização da pobreza, um, meaning that there's in Rio de Janeiro, we've always had rich and poor living fairly close together, especially in the wealthier parts of town. Not, not so true in Sao Paulo, where you have a very wealthy core and very poor peripheries. And so in Rio, we're pushing the poor out to the periphery. These colors here indicate human development index, which of course is a problematic characterization of wealth and well-being, but it does give indices of how much money people make and where they make it. And so the darker areas are the higher human development index and the lighter the less developed. And so the far west of the city is the less developed. These dots, the MC and V dots, are Minha Casa Minha Vida, which is the government, the federal sponsored housing project. And so uh, the, the cheaper land is of course in the west where the development is lower. And so the government is sending people to the far west. They're settling the poor in the west of the city where you have indices of jobs. So AP 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, you have uh, here on this line the jobs and the population percentage. And so in AP5, which is where most of the people are being settled, there are 6.98% of the formal jobs in the city of Rio de Janeiro. And so people are being moved to where there's no work. In AP1 and 2, uh, which is the center and the zona sul, combined between them they have about 60, 60 something percent of the formal jobs in the city. So where you have jobs, you would like to live. So everybody would like to live as close to work as possible, especially in a metropolitan area that has the longest commutes in the country. And so what we see is a pushing out of people from the wealthy Zona Sul, where the jobs are, to the west. And what does this look like? It looks like this. So these are the favelas that have been removed in the city in the last five years. And these, and then the yellow are the places where they've been resettled into Minha Casa Minha Vida housing projects. And so there's a clear tendency from the, from the east and the wealthy and the developed part of town to the west and the poor and the isolated part of town where there are very few jobs. Are you open to questions during your presentation? You want to wait? I, I prefer to wait to the end if you don't mind. Thank you. I can always come back to these slides as well. And so that's transportation. And I, I should be, I have an article coming about that housing situation and the transportation very soon that I can make available. The other key element of the project is security. And we've seen just this last week the pacification, uh, quote unquote, of the Mare favela. Um, and I'll show you a picture in a second. But we have, in the security project is uh, driven by a state led initiative by the military police called uh, Pacification, UPP, Unidade Policial Pacificadora. And there are now 40 or so units, and as you can see, almost all of them are inside the Olympic development rings. Those that are not inside the Olympic development rings are on Olympic transportation lines. Again, what does this pacification look like? It's led by BOPI, which is the elite urban fighting force of, Rio de Janeiro, of Rio's uh, troops. This is their symbol, the skull with a, with a dagger through the skull and two cross pistols behind. There was a, a great photo, I wish I'd included it the other day, that said, 
preparing, the path is cleared for peace. And I just had like, five of these guys walking into a community. It's like, okay, well, peace is one thing. This is, for me, this is, this is not peace. What it is, is, is really a counterinsurgency where you have, these are the community policemen that are patrolling all of the favelas in which the UPPs have been installed. And this is what it looked like the other day, where the national military, the national uh, naval force were called in 14,000 troops to occupy a community of 110,000 people. And so you really do have a military occupation that's on one hand replacing a system that was terrible, a military occupation by drug traffickers is also terrible, but this is the, it's not really the opposite, it's just a substitution of one lord of the hill with another. And what we've seen as a result are a lot of collateral effects. We've seen gentrification in a lot of the favelas, uh, in the Zona Sul especially, in Copacabana and Ipanema, where we've had, uh, where you remove the barriers to, f to capital accumulation, which were the drug traffickers, and you basically allow for a rent gap to establish itself. Um, because there's a social gap, as well as social uh, preconception of the, the middle classes really don't want to go into favelas because they, they're stigmatized. A lot of foreigners are coming in, and a lot of foreign capital are coming in, foreign capital is coming into favelas and establishing boutique hotels, new restaurants, uh, building apartments and such. <coughs> we have seen a dramatic decrease in homicides in UPP favelas. Uh, more than 75% decrease. But we've also seen an equivalent increase in disappearances. And one of the most notable cases of this was the Amarildo case last year that happened during the Confederations Cup when a common bricklayer was taken from a bar by the UPP and UPP police taken up to the top of the hill, tortured, and then disappeared. And this is happening repeatedly, uh, with repeated frequency in the UPP favelas as the, the, the network uh, of drug traffickers just tries to reestablish itself. The UPP police themselves are becoming more and more corrupt as they find ways to make money off the existing drug trade, etc. But in general, the UPP has had an effect of driving down homicides, but drug traffickers do not go become bankers from one day to the next, and so they simply move their activities to other parts of the city or to the interior of the state. And so the interior of the state of Rio has become a lot more violent as the drug traffic, the violent drug trafficking is simply dislocated there. And so the UPP is not a long-term solution. It is a structural uh, element of controlling strategic ter territories in Rio de Janeiro as it prepares to host the World Cup and the Olympics. And of course, this is part of a larger ideological project. Uh, the, this is, again, the monopoly game of Rio de Janeiro. The mayor's office had the brilliant idea of printing up 100,000 versions of this game to distribute to elementary schools around the city. As you can see, I mean, it's the monopoly, but the Maracanã, or the Engenhão Stadium is worth 260,000. The Olympic Park is worth 280,000, except you know, the Sambodromo is worth 300,000. And so this is basically, trying to get children to understand that bits and parts of the city can be sold and traded on the market. And of course, this is stuck in with the UPP ideology as well, where it says Sorci. Your, your building was valorized the, after the pacification of the favela nearby. Get 75,000 reais. And so this is what is driving the project, is turning Rio de Janeiro into more of a neoliberal uh, land of, of consumption. Okay, so what are these events bringing? And so this kind of restruction, the thing that we're seeing with the transportation, with the housing, and with the security project, they're bringing a new urban, they're restructuring the city along urban, economic, and social lines. And this is sold through the sustainability discourse of the Olympics. You know, it's going to bring a legacy, everything's green. The Maracanã is now LEED certified, which means that we recycle the water and we have uh, you know, solar panels and, and all the good stuff that LEED brings you. But of course, it's really a, a laboratory for all these different kinds of projects. 
and the Olympic project is one of them. This is the, the site of the Olympic Park. It looks all very green, although it has some kind of strange spermatozoa thing coming down the middle of it. I'm not sure what that's about. Social reproduction, perhaps. Um, and in the top left corner, you can see the Velo Autodromo. And I was actually on the, the team that helped to design this project for a little while. And their initial plan was just to wipe the Velo Autodromo off the map. Um, but I managed to have a little bit of influence with them to try to keep it and to urbanize it over time and using the structures and the people there that could then perhaps work in this new urban uh, model. The idea is to have over the long term, all right, well, but of course now, and, and the Villa Todormo had been resist, had been threatened with the removal for at least 20 years by the current mayor, who used to be the mayor of the region. I just took this the other day, that the mayor's office is going in and paying people uh, and dissimulating and, and trying to disarticulate the movement, the very strong movement uh, or strong community that the Villa Todormo has. And this person accepted more, a million reais for their, for their house. As soon as they signed, signed the paper, the, 10 minutes later, the bulldozer was there, eliminated the house. And in the background, you can see the Olympic Park being constructed. And so this is hugely valuable land on which a very poor community sits and has been sitting for 45 years. And most of the people have title to their land. The idea is to settle the gentry. And so this is gentrification. This is gentrifying the landscape so the gentry can go there. And so the Olympic project in 2030 will be a closed condominium complex accessible by car. And of course, the idea of the government is not to have the Villa Autodromo in the top left corner. It's to have more buildings of the same kind. And so we can also see this in so the Olympic project in general is going to look like this. This is the, the future Olympic Village, uh, which will be 36 25-story closed condominium buildings. This is a, a mock-up that didn't have all the buildings on there. With a 2.33 billion real government subsidy that goes to two of Brazil's biggest civil construction firms. So the civil construction firms don't have to risk their own money. They will build this uh, Olympic village with public money and then be able to sell the apartments on the open market to then pay back the loan. And so it's public risk, private profit. It's clearly a car dependent landscape and very high environmental impact because Baja de Tijuca does not have an adequate sewage system. There's, the sewage system does not go in first and then you build. The buildings come and then you think about connecting it to the sewage system. And so as you can see, it's a, it's a wetland region with a very high water table and is already hugely degraded because of these high impact, high consumption lifestyles. Of course, the Villa Todromo has a much lower consumptive lifestyle, but they have no sewage either. So all the sewage goes straight into the lakes that will surround the future Olympic Park. But again, it's a very retrograde, retrograde urban planning model based on cars, uh, closed condominiums, high security, and spatial fragmentation. I just wrote an article about this uh, that came out in Sustainability Journal. This is the 2016 Olympic golf course, which is occupying, of course, green golf course. How can it be environmentally damaging in any way? Um, which has changed the dynamics of this part of the, region, of part of the city because it was an environmental protected area. The entire thing had to then be cleaned, quote unquote, cleaned of, of exotic vegetation. And so was, everything was just scraped off so they could build this golf course. They have then changed the, the zoning laws to permit 22-story towers built along the edge, which will, may serve as five-star hotels during the, during the Olympics, and then be changed into um, upper-class condominiums afterwards. And so this is, again, a project that is touted as green. It's greenwashed, it's human-washed, but it's golf. Golf is an exclusionary practice in Brazil, um, it's, and it's just real estate speculation uh, done with public money. In other parts of the city, we have an urban operation, as if the patient were deadly ill and you need to substitute its kidney with a piece of steak or something. This is the Porto Maravilha project, 
which you can see that the, the zoning has been changed. These are the, the buildings of the future ghosting into reality. The zoning laws have been changed to allow 50-story buildings. These are, have been sold, the, uh, the real estate has been bought or has been given to a private consortium uh, through decree. Uh, these are federal lands and state lands that were given over to this private consortium. The, the titles to these buildings are to build over the legal limit are being sold through what are called sepakis, uh, which is additional building potential. And so if you have a 10-story building and you want to build to 25 stories, you can buy the right to build to 25 stories and then hopefully sell that right to an investor later on. No private companies appeared, and so the Caixa Económica Federal entered with uh, 9 billion reais of public money in this real estate speculation deal. And so this is, again, um, a process of gentrifying the landscape to create <coughs> a fantasized urban environment where instead of, uh, and this is, of course, the port area of Rio is where millions of slaves came into Rio with a very rich history of the birth of Samba, etc. But the main, the main cultural development is the Museum of Tomorrow. And so the Museum of Tomorrow wants to say, we don't want to remember the past. We want to look toward the future. And as the New York Times uh, architecture critic put it, it's being designed by yesterday's architect, Santiago Calvatra, who is being sued around the world for his, his projects not being completed on time or on budget. Again, this is the Porto Olimpico project which may now have some Trump Towers. Um, but again, this negative urbanism, exclusionary, fragmented, very uh, kind of Los Angeles 1980s look about it. And so in general, we can say that these mega events in, in Brazil, and this is what the, the social movements are calling into question, they're installing these re regimes of exception in which uh, we have the accumulation and concentration of capital, consolidation of power, the radical militarization of urban space, criminalization of poverty, uh, informality is excluded from the World Cup and the Olympics. In most ways, a lot of the, uh, what are called camelodromos, the, uh, the street vendors markets in Rio have been burned down or the, the informal vendors are being persecuted and a general commodification of culture, especially of beach culture, football culture, samba culture to sell the city on a global market. With these mega events, the coalitions and actors work in conjunction to transfer public wealth to private interests through a number of these mechanisms. One, these discursive structures of development, the moral pillars of Olympism, they, um, they justify these events. We have the uh, construction of these extra legal authorities such as the Empresa Municipal Olimpica the, at the city level. We have the Autoridade uh, Publico Olimpico at the national level, we have the local organizing committees, and none of these have any democratic channels in them whatsoever. And then after the event, they disappear. Um, and for me, this is a process of what Harvey calls accumulation by dispossession. So you take from the residents to give to others. And one of the ways you do this is by creating holidays, by appropriating territory, by dislocating people, by taking public money and putting it in the control of private interests. And of course, this is, I mean, these, all these ideas uh, kind of link back to what Naomi Klein has described as shock and awe theory, the disaster capitalism, where a mega event could be compared to the invasion of a country where instead of bombing people, you actually traumatize them with festa, with, with festival. And so you party them into distraction, you construct a parallel government. By the time they wake up, a new suite of laws have been introduced, the event is realized, and then the parallel government disappears and you have no one to complain to. Similar to the way the US shock and awed Iraq, put in the coalition provisional authority, changed the laws, disappeared, and you have a new constitution. And this, of course, is not just Rio. These are learning processes all around the globe. The similar things happen in London. Similar things happen in Vancouver. Uh, similar things will happen in Tokyo for the Olympics, anyway. And the social movements have a very important role in contesting these, these processes because these are the people that are getting articulated upon. And so you have an existing framework of social actors that live and breathe and work and produce the space of the city and that reality is being transformed in a, in a very combative 
in a very authoritarian and a very aggressive way. And so the long history of this in Rio de Janeiro is now coming not to its fruition nor its end, but these periodic climaxes. And so we saw the climax last summer during the Confederation Cup. We will see another one in the Olympic in the in a few months. And then in the Olympics we might see an even larger one as the empty promises of these events really start to uh, have ever more negative effects on what people uh, and how people can live in their in their cities. And so the main element of of the questioning of the social movements is culpa para quem? Who's benefiting with this World Cup? Where are the tangible benefits from all this public investment? And so this, I took this in Sao Paulo, a favela that's near the stadium, uh, the Corinthian Stadium, that's going to be likely removed before the World Cup. <clears throat> and there's an 820 million real stadium going up a couple hundred yards away, where just this last week we had the third worker die in three months because of the time pressures. Uh, and now the, the workers are on strike. And so we don't know what's going to happen with the, during the World Cup, but we can guarantee that the social movements will be there, that they are very well articulated, and that the projects in and of themselves are perceived and, and felt to have really negative effects on Brazilian society in general. And that's um, basically what I hope that uh, we will continue to ask as the, the World Cup uh, is broadcast around the world to several billions of people, like, who is this for? Copa para quem? Thank you. Questions? So, the transportation system, is that a private enterprise? Yes, all transportation in Rio has been privatized. So now also the new developments, even though they are initiated by public monies, eventually they go to private hands. Yes, the train is private, the metro is private, <clears throat> the, the ferries are private, the bridge that connects across the bay is private, um, the, all the bus lines are private, and then these new bus lines that are being put in have been the concessions to build and run those lines are private. So nothing, there's no public transportation whatsoever in Rio. So there is a social unrest that's latent there or is existing right now. So how is this going to be translating when the World Cup happens and there are millions of people going from all over the world, how safe is this place going to be? Well, I think, for instance, in Sao Paulo, the World Cup will be the 18th largest event in 2014 in Sao Paulo. And it's just a football game. It's a bunch of football games in a month, but we have football games every month. And so there won't be millions, necessarily millions of people entering into the system to use it. One of the reasons is because we're keeping everybody at home by declaring holidays. And so every time there's a World Cup game in, a, in Brazil, it's a holiday in that city. There are school holidays for the month. The universities are closed, the public schools are closed, banks will not operate, governments will be closed on, on, on game days. And so you keep people at home is another way of dispossessing them. And so you're not allowed to circulate in the city. And so you're opening so you're allowing, you're taking pe the people that live there off the streets and putting other users in their place to try to lessen the stress on the system. So how does this, this, this scenario look like, let's say, four years, five years, ten years from now, I mean, the normal situation? Yeah, well, I think I showed the tendency is to isolate the poor ever more from the wealthy areas of the city. And so where the Olympic rings are, you, you're creating both wealthier, uh, a wealthier residential profi profile, and so you have a general uh, process of gentrification, um, and then the dislocation, but then you also have a security ring. And so you're going to have not only a wealthy uh, element of the city, but a very secure element of the city. And then you have the non-secure element of the city. And so you're creating, we're augmenting even more the social and spatial disparities that exist in Rio de Janeiro. And it's a very deliberate project to, and these transportation lines are linking areas of poverty with the Baja de Tijuca region. We're not creating a transportation network. And so you're basically funneling the poor to a, a wealthy part of the city to work as uh, cheap, cheap labor um, because there's not, also not a lot of jobs in that, and there's not formal employment in that part of the city. Uh, and so this is the, the geopolitical project of the city is to consolidate that power and to make as much money as possible in the shortest time frame. Yes. Uh, 
Uh, with all this privatization, is there any command price controls, like the $20 bus rides during the event? Uh, there, there has been some attempt to control the prices on hotels, but I think a, a daily rate in Rio for the World Cup is around four hundred and fifty dollars, and so that's control. Uh, but transportation is going to be the same, <clears throat> same deal. Yeah, private transportation will increase, but you, know, you can't just put the metro prices up to ten dollars. You know, and so the metro is three. It's it's gone up. It's it's about three eighty now. Um, which, again, to translate to dollars doesn't really make sense because you make your money in local currency, and so it's, it's nearly four dollars to take the metro in relative terms. It's three dollars for a bus, uh, or three reais for a bus. And so those things won't increase, but taxis will increase their fares because people won't know. Um, yeah, there's not, there's not a lot of control, and this is one of the problems is that there's also no rent control. And so in favelas, where there's typically a high rate of home ownership, the rents are more stable because people are not leaving because of these rent pressures. But in places that have more transient population, you can charge ever more rent. And so everybody in Rio de Janeiro who has an extra room is renting it out for $150, $250 a day. I'm doing it too. I mean, that's just, you know, I have journalists coming in that are willing to pay or able to pay $200 a day to stay in my extra room. And that's just... You know, it's it's not it's it's uh, what we would call it. It's opportunismo contra oportunidade, and so everybody's using this as an, as an opportunist and not as an opportunity, and that's gen that's generally the attitude of, of Brazilians towards the World Cup, and I think people see that coming from the top down, uh, that the government that the the PT is using this to enrich themselves, and that their friends in business are using it to enrich themselves, and so everybody else should also do the same. Yeah, I think this is one of the big questions. The, they haven't entered into the, they haven't entered formally into the political dispute about the mega events. And I do think that something like the Comando Vermelho, at least in Rio, is not, they're not political actors and they're not as organized as we think they are. And they're certainly not very conscious of their polit the political role that they could have because they're typically very uneducated, very young, um, very limited, they're very limited even to their knowledge of the city. They know their, where they live, they know their little, uh, you know, how the gang works, but I don't know that they have a real idea about how to circulate in the larger city. If they did, they could stop the event. Uh, and there is a certain sort of, co a certain collusion between the military police and the drug trafficking gangs, but that makes the military police just another gang. Uh, and in the whole western half of the city is, is, of Rio is dominated by milicias, which are um, off-duty cops, firemen, and civil servants that have pushed out drug traffickers and taken control of the favelas. And they have the explicit approval of the mayor to do so because it makes his job of policing that large region of the city that much easier. And so the drug gangs are not really major players in the articulation, but they're being kicked out of their territories in order to guarantee the circulation of tourists and money and FIFA and everybody for the event. And that's why you see the concentration within those four Olympic rings. Um, most Olympics have a cultural component um, along with it, either a cultural Olympiad or an arts festival. Uh, what impacts do you foresee or what impacts have you seen um, with this regard, with regard to that? We haven't seen any development for the Olympics in that regard whatsoever, and nothing for the World Cup. Uh, there's been a few development projects here and there where FIFA's plopped down and stuck their flag in the ground and said, okay, well, here, here's you know, $100,000 for a field. But the Olympics haven't even released the full budget yet, and so I don't think they're really worried about the cultural element. There might be something tacked on to the end, but I don't envision that there will be any long-term uh, repercussions of any cultural investment for the Olympics, unfortunately. Uh, you mentioned uh, the mega event and violation of human rights book. Where can we find that? Yeah, that's on the Comité. Uh, I'll go back to that. Back to that slide. Uh, I think I had the website up there. 
if you search Comité Popular Rio, just in case you forgot what I had talked about. Come on. Oh my gosh. Sorry. Well, let's get out of here and do this. There we go. That's the website right there. It's available for download as a PDF file. And we're working on the update for the, we're re re redoing, we redo this every year, or every two years, and we're just about to release one for, right before the World Cup, that will also be available on that site. Yes, ma'am. I'm not familiar with it. Um, really good book. Rose to words. It's about human waste. Mm -hmm. uh, I was in uh, Rio in the summer of 2012, and um, uh, we drove from the airport across that bridge you mentioned, across that big lagoon, and all I can say is it seems that that's already being used as a sewer deposit. Yeah. Our taxi driver assured us we would be through it in just a few minutes. We wouldn't have to smell it anymore on the other side. But um, it, it struck me very strongly that there is already a deficiency of sewer treatment in the city. Yeah, it's a, a really big, big, big problem, and especially for the Olympics, which um, wants to have sailing and windsurfing competitions in the bay. Um, it's, again, it's 13 and a half million people that use the bay as an open sewer. And this has a long story going back to the, the ECHO 92 conference, the first UN conference in, in Rio. Following that conference, the state government received a $2 billion loan from the World Bank to build uh, sewage treatment plants, to build five sewage treatment plants around the bay. They built them. But no one gave them any money to plug anything into it, and so they don't work. And so then after the 2012 conference, they got another billion dollars from the World Bank to build sewage treatment plants again, but nothing's being done. And so what they have done with that money is to get 10 boats that go out every day with big nets and scoop up trash. And that's it. And so we don't have, um, we have some some small projects being done. Uh, in Ipanema, uh, there's a project. They have this innovative little robot that they put into sewage, sewage pipes that goes up to see if, the, you know, to take pictures to see if uh, buildings are connected or not, and frequently they're not. But then they just get a fine, and it's fre frequently the fine is much less than, than actually connecting the thing. And so all of these big towers in Baja de Tijuca are just throwing their human waste directly into the waterways. And this is, again, millions of people with no real solution in sight. And the, that smell that you had, that's, that's just typical. And that, that's how I know I'm home. And I get that, hmm, ah, ooh. It's evolutionary in the according to this book, to detect sulfur dioxide and get away from it. Yeah, unless, if you can. Yeah. And if you're 20 stories up, you can get away. But if you live in those communities, and those are communities right on that water, they just have never had the infrastructure. Um, the state has never been present in any way. Um, and this is a housing problem as well. So it's housing, it's transportation, it's, it's labor, but it's also the ability of the state to go into these places and establish meaningful infrastructural projects that um, they are then there to maintain. And while they have some little projects here and there, in general, the state of Rio's environment is, is deplorable. Yes, you should be. Um, it's, you know, it's some, uh, in 2011, I think the last I have data in my head for, 
you couldn't swim in Ipanema Beach more than half the days because of the fecal chloroform levels. And so if you're, even if you're playing football on the beach or playing volleyball on the beach, they have those little showers that come out, and those also have fecal chloroform levels above, like five times above the norm, and they smell like sewage. And so if you're not in the water getting feces on you, you're taking a shower in feces. And the, the, situ the, the sewage situation in Ipanema and Copacabana is that the, there are tubes that shove it out 700 meters into the sea, untreated. And then when, when the tide comes in, or the big surf, or, or the currents, carry it back into the, into the beaches. And I live in Flamengo, which has a marvelous beach, but you can't swim in the bay. But people go in the water. They do. Yeah, because yeah, you just do. You, you, you risk it. And if your arm doesn't fall off, then hey, it's fine. We joke that, the, uh, that you, could, you could start as an Olympic swimmer, and by the end of your swim, you could be a Paralympic swimmer. If you, <laughs> it's not funny, but it's, just, it's, really a bad, it's really a bad situation. And it doesn't really seem like it's going to improve, and so it's likely that the 2016 people will have to move both the, all of the water sports out of Rio and further up the coast, where it's less polluted. They didn't actually distribute it because there was such a, a an uproar, oh, but they did they did produce it. It, it didn't. Like the, the plan to do it, and they did print up a hundred thousand copies, but they didn't actually distribute it. Well, the logic is that, what's wrong with it? What's wrong with thinking about things this way? This is the way it is. And so we should, instead of thinking communally, we should just think about how we can buy and trade and sell the city. And so this is, we want this to be the reality. It is the reality for the mayor. It is the reality for the governor. It is reality for 2016. And these, operate, these urban operations, the Olympics, are all justifications for real estate speculation. And so why not teach children the values of the people that are promoting these things? And for them, there's no, there's no conflict in this. Um, they don't recognize it as an ideological project. For a lot of people, most people that protested against it, it's like, well, you can't teach elementary school kids to buy and sell their own city with each other because then, then what's left? There's no, you should be teaching other values. Yeah, and the idea is that valorization of real estate is always good, um, but it's not. It, we, we have this model of capitalism where growth is the only measure of progress has to be combated in some way. And so people that have seen their apartments valorized, the only way to really capitalize on that, literally, is to sell it. And then where do you go? If everything in your neighborhood has gone up, you're just going to move laterally and spend the same money you just made to get another apartment. Or you have to go to a poorer place. And so valorization creates gentrification. Um, and unless you're willing to sell your place, you're, uh, you're not benefited because all the commercial real estate also gets more expensive. And you're not necessarily making equivalent, equivalently more money. And so if the commercial real estate increases, they have to pass on those costs through their products to you. And so valorization actually hurts you because you have to pay more money for products and you end up paying more property tax. And the real estate market in Rio has increased across the city by 258% in the last five years. Some, of course, some places more than others. And in the pacified favelas, in the, when they announced the pacification, boom, 200% real estate increase in pacified favelas, like Hosinia, Vigigal, Pavel, Pavel, Zinia. And so it's a very deliberate, pacification is a, product, is, is, is a market-oriented product. And it, it is a product that's sold. It's sold through the media. It's actually financed by private companies. Equipachista, Brazil's formerly richest man, was funding the UPP project uh, at 20 million reais a year. Then he backed out. But it's also funded by the Light Company. It's funded by Sky TV. 
Um, and so sometimes you have the Balpi going up the hill and planting. What they do is they plant the Rio State and the Brazilian flags. And frequently they have Sky TV going up right behind it and selling legal cable subscriptions. And so there's clearly a market ideology behind the UPP um, that has to do as much with reducing lethal violence in these communities as it does with opening them up as market opportunities. That's <clears throat> that's ambitious. Um, I don't know if so, I'd, I'd take that risk. Is there a speculator yeah, well, one of the things that might keep Rio relatively stable, there are two things that will keep Brazil relatively stable. One is its incredible inefficiency. And so this is one of the things that protected it in 2008 from the global crash, is that Brazil mar Brazilian markets are not that responsive. Um, and so it takes a long time to destabilize Brazil um, because the banking system is inefficient. Secondly, is that the oil, Rio is the head of uh, is the center of Rio, of Brazil's oil production industry, and so you have a lot of foreigners coming in with a lot of money to work in Brazil's oil fields, and so this will keep a lot of the real estate very high for at least as long as Petrobras is pumping oil, um, and it's you know kind of the, the media center of the country, and so but there will be a crash. There will be a crash around 2017 once the once the lights have gone off on the Olympics. Uh, it's going to be a pretty grim scene in Rio, I think. Yeah, um, too. yeah, but especially Rio because the security situation is so tenuous with the exactly. with the UPP. And if there's a ma major sea change in the state governor's office, and they don't want to fund the UPP, which costs a billion reais a year just in salaries, a billion for this UPP project, if they decide that they don't have as money as much money coming in and they want to start cutting it, or at least in certain areas, then the drug traffickers come back in. The drug traffickers will settle the accounts with the people that were collaborating with the UPPs and take back those territories. And we're already seeing this happen um, in a lot of favelas, especially Complexo de Limão, um, Pavo Pavozinho, uh, Cantagabo, Rocinha, uh, a lot of gunfights in the last month that shows kind of the, the frayed edges of this UPP project, um, which comes in, as you see, like the, the tanks and the Marines and the army come in and have a big media circus which is much, is, as much about performing security for an international audience as it is really providing uh, security for the people that live there. Um, I think about a year ago or so, I read uh, in a Globo or someplace like that that one of the stadiums, the two stadiums, isn't there in the Rio? Yeah. It was not. It was the engine. You know, and it reminds me the, of the exhibit here, the Gahimbara, with all the you know the things that are tying everything together. And so this is exactly what's happened with the engine Stadium, which was built in 2007 for the Pan American Games, which had a cost per seat. It was the same stadium that was built in Lisbon for the 2004 Euro Copa, um, but it, the cost per seat was three times as much. <clears throat> and so it was built in 2007. In 2013, the it was discovered that there were critical uh, fissures in the roof structure and it had to be closed for danger of the roof falling down on 40,000 fans. And so what they're doing is a gahimbara. They're putting extra poles on the side and pulling the roof back so it stays up. And it's supposedly going to be open again for the Olympics, but it's been closed for the last year and a half and there's no, there's no real, um, there's no calendar for it to open. And of course, during this time, the person responsible for, the, for that work was the current mayor, who was then the state secretary of sport and leisure. And of course, it takes no responsibility for it. 
because it was part of the Pan American Games. And so this is one of the things that's, that's critical to remember is that there's a, is a development agency built to, to run the games, to build these infrastructures. And the people in there have no legal responsibility once that game, once the game is over because that agency disappears. And so even though the current mayor was the state secretary responsible for that project, he has no legal responsibility because that agency has disappeared. And now he's in charge of issuing decrees for the World Cup and the Olympics. And, I got, and on we go. A moment ago you were talking about the media, and I was wondering how does mainstream media portray these social movements of Brazil, and how do you notice the differences between domestic versus international media? Are they buying into some of these media Yeah, that's a good question. The, and let's see, we take two, Two examples. One is, is the occupation of the Complexo de Alimão, which happened in 2010. It was very much like any one of our run-of-the-mill American invasions of a country, where you have you know, pictures of the soldiers with all their different equipment. You have the tanks and how fast they can go, how many bullets a minute they can shoot, all the technical details of what's going in to pacify this community. And it was called the War for Rio. Um, the international media were there, of course, in spades and, and their, their bulletproof vests and such, saying, you know, using this as kind of this dramatic moment of occupation. The recent occupation of Mare was primarily covered by international journalists who were embedded with the military. So they're all running after the military with their cameras and playing cowboy with their bulletproof vest, even though not a, not a shot was fired during the occupation. And the national media basically says, oh, look, uh, we, we took the favela in 15 minutes without firing a shot. How tough are these traffickers? Uh, and so that's the, the, you know, kind of this making the, the military police into these heroes that are fighting for liberty for, the, for Brazil's middle class, basically. Although they're actually acting in the service of Brazil's elites, much like the American military here. The social movements, when the protests began in Sao Paulo and in the south of Brazil, relative to the Passe Livre movement, the media was fully against them. And then as the protests grew and grew and grew, the media started getting shot. And the military police made the huge mistake of shooting rubber bullets at journalists and knocking out a few eyeballs, hitting people on the forehead, and really wounding and going after journalists as if they were um, insurgents. And so after that moment, the media really flipped onto the side of the protests, which made them grow very quickly. And so once the media was saying, oh, these are, these are not vandals, they're manifestantes. You know? and so, but then as soon as the black blocs came in and started taking the legitimacy out of those movements, it all became, again, oh wait, maybe we got, went too far. Now the media switches to call people vandalos. And so the discursive frames of the national media very basically in accordance with the, what's going to benefit the editor's line, which is uh, maintaining government power, keeping banks functioning, et cetera. And so when, when, the, when the protests turned against public installations and against the banks, then, then the media started changing their tune as well. The international media had a very different perspective on this. Um, and it's another, you know, one of the roles, one of my roles in this has been to be really an articulator of the social movements with the international media. And so, you know, I don't know of, a, I think maybe El País is the only major newspaper in the world I haven't talked to uh, in the last two years. And just because the guy is an old correspondent that lives somewhere in the hinterland of, of Brazil and, and doesn't actually interview anybody anymore. Um, but it, it's, it's, you know, the, the role of academics in this is to be, uh, especially in the international media, is to, are, to get the discursive frames straight for the international media to then report. What was the name of that other stadium with the bad It's the Ingenion. It's the Olympic Stadium. It's uh, called the Estadio Olimpico João Havalange, which is a name I swore to myself I would never pronounce in public. I'm sorry. This is the former president of FIFA, um, who was Joao Havalange, um, who has been defrocked, basically, from both his honorary position as FIFA president and a member of the IOC as he enters into his 95th year.
but. Oh yeah, no, you can't because there, there's nothing happening there. Yes. Yeah, I don't know that. Yeah, I don't know that there was a Plan A, so we might have started with Plan B, <laughs> and we might be going to Plan G by the time we get to the World Cup. Um, most of the stadiums in the cities are centrally located, and so access is not too much of a problem. Um, the major problem will be with internal flights. Um, one of the reasons is that the Brazilian Air Force just issued a decree saying that there can't be any flight within a four nautical mile radius of a stadium within a seven hour window of a game. And so, you, so all the journalists that are coming from all around the country to get to games, they've had to, they've had to cancel more than 800 flights. Um, and this just happened a couple of weeks ago. And so the, the air traffic is going to be super chaotic. Um, people trying to rent cars to go from Belo Horizonte to Manaus. You can see it on the map, like, oh yeah, we'll get there. But they'll get there in 2017, you know? There's just no way to get there. Um, and so the logistics of getting people between one city and another are going to be hugely problematic. I imagine the Americans, for example, have their base in Sao Paulo. They're playing in Natal, Manaus, and Fortaleza. And the American fans are the ones that have the foreign group that bought the most tickets. There are 145,000 Americans going to Brazil. The majority of them will probably want to see the Americans play. And so how do you get, say, 30,000 Americans from Natal to Manaus in a day? I, I don't know. And, and then how do you get them to Fortaleza? And then how do you get them if they qualify for the next round? And, so, and you can't, for instance, buy, a credit, uh, buy an airline ticket with a foreign credit card on Brazilian websites. And so you have to have a CPF fee, you have to have a Brazilian credit card, or you have to go through a foreign website to get like a cheapo air or something to get a ticket on a Brazilian airline as a foreigner. They haven't revised all these things yet. And so that's plan, plan B is plan Brazil. You know, it's just, you have to dar um jeito. And that actually is the, the, the name of the closing song for the World Cup is dar um jeito. Like we'll, we'll find a way, you know. <laughs> And that's going to be, you know, kind of symbolizes, you know, what's going to have to happen for the World Cup to come off. But again, it's not that complicated. There are 64 football games. All Brazilian cities have football games every week. Um, it's not, it's a logistical nightmare for FIFA, for fans. But if you're in a city, you know, putting 75,000 people in the Maracanã is no big deal. If you have traffic, you get on the bus early, or you get, get on the metro, and you're there. You have to go five hours early before the game. Whatever, you're there. It's not such a big deal. The Olympics are an order of magnitude more impactful and will create a lot more problems for Rio. What do you think um, the Olympic legacy of Rio 2016 will be? Because you mentioned legacy, and that's something that goes, and all this push is having a legacy. What do you think? Yeah, one, the, I always put legacy in quotes because it, legacy itself is a discursive frame that it, the IOC has created to justify everything, and you only have positive legacy. And so the, the mayor's office actually created what's called the uh, legodometro, the legacy meter. And so they had <coughs> things that went from, it was, you were from one to five on the legacy meter. And so it was impossible to have a negative legacy. So even if you had one, it's positive, right? So you, you met 25% of your legacy goal, it's still positive. And so there's no negative legacy. And so there's not going to be much. It's, so it's impacts. There will be some positive impacts in terms of job creation, in terms of having public uh, tennis courts, for instance. That would be maybe really nice to have some tennis courts. But in general, I think Rio is only going to lose with the Olympics. And I think that it's ruining that the, both the World Cup 
when you, when you host these events, you expose yourself to a number of risks, economic um, attack from terrorists or whatever. You no know, one ever thought of attacking Rio as a terrorist site, perhaps, until they got the Olympics and the World Cup. But then also exposing your city for what it is. Um, and I think that Rio and Brazil had a really positive image abroad before all these things, uh, before the international media really focused their attention on the problems and the realities of Brazilian cities. And that really lost a lot in the international eye relative to urban planning, relative to security, relative to social justice, relative to the enforcement of the really good laws that we do have there. Um, I think we've lost a lot. And so that is the real risk that Rio runs. And you know, it's a beautiful city. It, it looks good on film. Um, and it's a great city to visit. But in terms of living there, it's really not got much of a positive future. Thank you all for your questions. Thank you. <laughs>